seated. This time I give an invitation to all the boys and girls, all our children that are gathered here this morning. Come up and join me on the platform. Let's spend a few moments together. If you have money for the Angel Bank, immediately come and start putting that in. God who has come to us, he's the one who forgives our sin. 
find your story in the Bible. Jesus is the one, and we talk about love. Uh, he's the greatest expression of love. He gives us life, eternal life. He puts joy in our heart. He died on the cross to save us, and we need to put our faith in Him. So all of you are pretty good spellers. And I thank y'all for coming down tonight. That's gospel spelling because uh, it seems like wherever you start out, it always comes around to Jesus. And so uh, all the important words in the Christian faith, they kind of all uh, be summed up when we say the word Jesus. Thank you all for those that uh, help you. You need to help spell the word. Well, we'll have another lesson tonight. We'll get someone else to help me out. Uh, let's have a prayer. Anybody got any prayer concerns? Anything you want to mention today? You got one, huh? Oh, we are praying for all those people down in that hurricane area. You were down there, weren't you? You just weren't in a bad hurricane area. Yeah, well, thank the Lord that uh, just, uh, just some rain made a little wind. Well, we're thankful you wouldn't like to have that. Ah, that's right. Excellent. Excellent. You want to ask for a prayer for Father, I thank you for our boys and girls this morning. We thank you, Jesus, that so many wonderful words in the Bible, when we look at those words and even when we spell them like uh, we did, they just remind us and they, they always take us to you because you are our King. You forgive our sin. You give us joy, you give us love, you give us life, uh, and we can put our faith in you. We uh, do. I want to lift up all the people, and especially all the boys and girls, uh, where the weather is so disruptive there in line. So here's the request of our children this morning. We thank you that we love you, and especially that you love us so much. Um, thank you all for coming in. I think I forgot to put this in the bulletin, but I want to be sure that you know about it. This anthem was purchased and given uh, in memory of Bill Kemp uh, by Lydia and Robert Smith and Kitty and Sonny Hawkins.
for sure, one place or another, we will be having our evening outdoor service. Uh, we're not sure at this point, and we will wait and see if that's going to have to be helped uh, inside. I know the weather is very uncertain. Uh, I normally am a little bit nervous almost every Sunday before I speak. And so I know Shane and Emily are nervous about uh, tonight, probably thinking, why in the world, when Brother Barry asked us uh, a few weeks ago, did we say, yeah, so uh, be in prayer for them and uh, support our time together uh, t tonight, regardless if it's inside or if we set it up uh, inside, I think you will be blessed. My message this morning is taken of John, the sixth chapter. Uh, it's, it's a very long chapter, and I, I just picked out a, a portion of it to read. Uh, it begins with Jesus feeding the 5,000. It's also the, the story of Jesus walking on the water. Uh, and it would really profit you if you have time just, just to look at the whole of this chapter. Decision time. Will you or not, or to use a little bit less proper grammar, will you or won't you? I'm going to begin with verse 47 and read through verse 69. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Do you, Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Perhaps there is no more heroic historical recollection in our country than what happened at the little mission fort in Texas, the Alamo. We know that story very well, that Colonel William Travis, realizing that they were about to be surrounded and overwhelmed, took his sword and he drew a line in the sand. 
And he said to that group of men, if you will stay and defend this fort to the death, step over this line. And to a man, some 232 men stepped across that line. Well, that's not really so. Uh, one of them was so sick, Jim Bowie, that he had to ask to be carried over the line. And there was a... I'm not saying anything about the French, if that's your background, but there was a French mercenary who did not and who slipped away and could tell that story. In our scripture this morning, Jesus Christ draws a very clear spiritual line. And by doing so, he immediately reduced his following from 5,000 men to about 12 men and perhaps a few more. Most preachers, if they preached a single message that reduced the attendance that much, would not be in the pulpit the next Sunday. Verse 66 makes it clear. It, it, it's not just the crowd that goes away, but many of his disciples stopped following him at that point. So drastic was this defection that Jesus turned to the 12 and he already knew that even one of them was going to be his betrayer. And he said, do you want to leave too? Are you still with me? Are, are you guys on board? Will you keep following me? It was decision time. Will you or not? And probably Simon Peter has no finer moment or insight uh, in the Gospels than the response he makes in verse Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. We see in this passage the Christ, the God, who is the bread of life. This is the first of the seven great I am statements in the Gospel of John where Jesus stated his divinity. In fact, Jesus says it four times in this chapter. At verse 35, verse 41, 48, and 51. If Jesus is the bread of life, then he is the source and the meaning of life itself. For bread has always been considered, as far as food, the essential. It's called the staff of life, the basic stuff of life. I'm glad that Jesus didn't say, I'm the steak of life. Now, I really like steak, but I can't always afford steak. I'm glad Jesus didn't say, I'm the caviar of life. That, that would have meant it was for an exclusive group. Uh, he didn't say, I'm the cake of life. That would have meant he was an optional choice. But now bread, bread, that's the staple. Yeah, even if you're poor, you usually have bread. The, the rich have bread. It, it's not a regional food. It's, it's not an American food. No particular place or country can, can make an exclusive claim to bread. Have you ever noticed? Go to almost any restaurant above the luxury level of McDonald's and they'll serve you bread and you'll get so full what have you, that you may not even be hungry when the main meal arrives. Bread is something that's eaten daily. So you see some food, some fruits are only available in season. Not so with bread, then not so with Jesus. He can nourish our hearts, not just in certain months or at special events, but daily. Je Jesus is saying, I'm the one who meets everyone's need. In Christ, 
we find all that is necessary to give and maintain real life. Uh, can you see why Jesus is calling himself the bread of life? What bread does for you physically, Jesus can do for you spiritually for your stomach. Jesus had fed this crowd a little earlier, and they were very impressed that he had done so. But now he's pointing to a deeper hunger, a hunger of the soul, a hunger of the heart that, that all people experience, just as real as physical hungry. Uh, only God can feel, only God can satisfy the hunger in human hearts. Our deepest need is for a relationship with the living God, whether realized or not. Just as everybody is gonna eat something physically. That's also true spiritually. With what will you fill your life? Now, notice the, the contrast between what Jesus offered and what the crowd, there was a strong clash of expectations going on here. It, in fact, it says uh, they thought his teaching to be very harsh. <laughs> they, they grumbled uh, some was some were offended. Now, when we read this today, we immediately uh, can't help but think about the, the Lord's Supper, but they didn't have that in their understanding when Jesus originally said that. The crowd had been ex excited because of what they'd seen Jesus do. Healings, miracles, feeding multitudes. But now Jesus is about to burst their bubble. Their excitement is based on some false assumptions about him. The assumption that Jesus has come to be their political leader, that he's come to make life e easy, that he's come to give them what they want. Many stopped following him. Who stopped? following Jesus and, and, and why did they leave and, and I believe I can identify three groups that were in those that left first of all they were the materialist M many of the people who followed Jesus at this point were hoping for a political savior they wanted a political solution free handout material goods for them Jesus was the latest and the greatest gravy train now, missionaries in third world countries used to talk a lot about rice Christians. Rice Christians, what are they? Th these are people who will quickly convert to Christianity in exchange for food, rice, or some other physical benefit. The problem with rice Christians is that when the goodies are gone, so are they? And listen, we're not too much different uh, in American Christianity. Too many people use the church for business contacts or community status. Rice Christians can be found all over the world. These people look only to God for what they can do. Quick back and he fails to deliver. The second group I believe that would have been if these people couldn't get a free lunch, they at least the rules ones that wanted a myself salvation that Jesus might be essential for any person to be in a right relationship with God. Jesus had said earlier in this chapter, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent, pointing to himself. You see, Jesus wanted a genuine relationship with each one of us. That kind of relationship can't be bought with goodies, and it can't be built on rules, self-righteousness. The materialist wanted the goodies more than they wanted God. The legalist wanted the law, but not the giver of the law. They rejected Jesus. And I believe there was one more group that probably walked out on him that day. We'll call these the sensationalists. These people had asked Jesus a question earlier in this chapter. What miraculous sign then will you give 
that we may see it and believe you. What will you do? They ask that in verse 30 of this sixth chapter. And we have plenty of those kind of church goers today. Uh, you might call them pep rally believers. Keep them wild and keep them entertained, but bore them and they're gone. These people are always craving spiritual excitement. Uh, they love the spectacular. They want new experiences all the time. They want Jesus to take them from one mountaintop to the next mountaintop with no valleys in between. They want all kind of blessings but no responsibilities. You see, the response of the crowd tells us a lot about the difference between what people want and what people need. So often, the very thing, the last thing they're looking for. When you think about it, those people that walked out just didn't want what Jesus had told them he had come to give. They wanted to do business with Jesus, the soup kitchen Jesus, Jesus, the political leader, Jesus, the miracle worker. But now Jesus, the bread of life, that, that just didn't resonate with them. It didn't play well in Peoria, as they say, so they walked away. Now note it wasn't anything that Jesus did that offended them, but what he taught about what he did. The real issue here is how can a person enter into a real relationship with God? God sent the bread of life in the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. The only source of the bread of life is Jesus Christ and the only access that we can have to that bread is through the cross and the resurrection. How are we given this bread of life? It is the gift of God made possible through the cross and yet the cross is a stumbling block. Either one accepts God's provision and receives it, or one is offended and insists upon his own ideas of what must be done to do the works of God. We don't need the loaves and fishes. We need the great I am. And he meets us through the cross where we find grace, forgiveness, and life eternal. That's why the claims of Christ to be the bread of life must be accepted on his terms or rejected. There's no fence straddling, no middle ground. Uh, listen, many of this crowd, even those who had been counted as disciples, now decided it was too demanding, too costly, too narrow to be a disciple. You see, in the Christian life, salvation is free, but discipleship is costly. <laughs> and I remembered a little incident that happened during the first Gulf War when a soldier who had been several years serving in the military sued to get out of the army. And his defense was this. He said, I signed up for the army during peacetime. No one told me I might have to go to war. He lost that case, by the way. Listen, the same thing happens in the church. People say, well, I signed up to be a church member and all the privileges, but no one told me I might have to actually be a Christian out there in the real world where it is costly and where it hurts and where it is inconvenient. Well, I tell you, the bread of life is costly. It costs God, his son, to give it. It costs us to accept it in terms of commitment and stewardship and obedience. Some in this congregation will recognize a great Christian name, a man named Clarence Jordan. He was centered in Georgia. He started the Conania Farms. He's also uh, responsible for a version of Scripture, a paraphrase of Scripture, the, the Cotton Patch Gospel. And he really is the uh, 
inspiration behind what we call today Habitat for Humanity. Clarence Jordan had a brother who was a lawyer and went on to become a very prominent politician in Georgia. Uh, because of what Clarence was trying to, to do, he, he was really a hippie before they were hippies down there in Georgia. It seemed like he was continually fighting legal battles. And, and so he, he went to his brother, the lawyer, to see if his brother would help him with one of the, the controversies over his farm. And this brother who would go on to serve on the Georgia Supreme Court said no. And then this conversation took place between Clarence and his brother. Clarence, I can't do that. You know my political aspirations. Why, if I represented you, I might lose my job, my house, everything I've got. We might lose everything too, Bob, said Clarence. It's different. Why is it different, asked Clarence. I seem to remember that you and I joined the church the same Sunday as boys. I expect when we came forward, the preacher asked me the same questions he asked you. He asked me, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And I said, yes. What did you say? His brother said, I follow Jesus, Clarence, up to a point. point back the cross that's right I follow him to the cross but not on the cross I'm not getting myself crucified Clarence said then I don't believe brother you're a disciple you're an admirer of Jesus but not a disciple of his I think you ought to go back to the church you belong to and tell them you're an admirer not a disciple well now, countered Bob, if everyone who felt like that did that, we wouldn't have a church, would we? The question Clarence said is, what kind of church would we then have? What kind of church would we then have? We must give ourselves to Christ who becomes the new source of our life. Will you go also? Do you want to leave? Are you still with me? I wouldn't be honest if, if I didn't admit some, sometimes. I, I confess when it comes to following Jesus, I, at a very minimum, I take a spiritual time out. <laughs> I have to say, Lord, I'm not always with you. I don't want to do that. I don't want to go there. I, I want to be willing. And you really can't say it any better than what Peter says in these last couple of verses. Nobody else to go to. You're the guy. You have the words of eternal life. We believe and I know that you are the Holy One of God. You see, Peter understood something here. He based his answer on a personal, personal Jesus. Listen, you finally follow Christ because your heart won't let you do anything else but follow. The Christian faith is not a philosophy we accept, not a theory to which we give allegiance, not a movement that we join. It is a personal response to Jesus Christ, who he is, and what he offers. There is not just something to believe in to be a Christian, but there is someone to believe in, to know, accept, love, and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter wasn't following Jesus to get a fish sandwich or to start a Jewish revolt against Rome or, or, or to get in on a Jesus pep rally or to hold a big miracle crusade outside of town. He was there because he believed in his heart that Jesus was the Holy One, the Messiah, the bread of life. And he knew he had what he needed, Jesus himself. Is Jesus what you need? Your bread of life? 
If you had been there the day I preached the bread of life sermon, would you have walked away? Or could you have echoed Peter's words, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe, I believe, and know you are the Holy One of God. Will you or not? Will you or won't you? There's a decision to be made. He's going to come and uh, lead us in our hymn. It's 2129. The altar now is open for prayer, for a response, for a decision. If you're here and you've never made a firm decision to accept Jesus Christ, follow him as your Lord and Savior, you can do that this morning. I'll be glad to, to share and pray with you, but you can do it in your pew. You can do it at the altar rail. Uh, the, we, uh, during this time of invitation, I give an opportunity if those would like to confess their faith in Christ, if there be someone or a family that like us, we extend that invitation. Would you stand now as we sing together? Uh, the first of that 16th. 
so we are just very, very glad to welcome them. And as is our custom, you don't have to wait for everything to finish. As soon as I get the benediction, just rush up here to embrace her and don't overwhelm her up. And welcome her into the All Her Stand family. Let us receive this benediction. Mary, God bless you. It's my joy to welcome you to our friendship. And now go forth, assured in the love of the Father, grace that comes to us through our Savior Jesus Christ and knowing that the Holy Spirit abides within. Amen. Thank you.